Section four of the Adventures of Bob White by Thornton W. Burgess. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twelve The Little Bob Whites at School. Everybody goes to school, that's the universal rule. Mother Nature long ago said it always should be so. Of course, there are all kinds of schools, but to one kind or another, everybody has to go. A lot of people don't know they are going to school, but they are just the same. If you should ask them what school they go to, they would tell you they don't go to any. But they do, just the same. They go to the hardest school of all, the school of experience. That is the school in which we all learn how to live and take care of ourselves. It is just the same with the little meadow and forest people. The four babies of Johnny and Polly Chuck went to school in the old orchard, just as soon as they were big enough to run around. It was the same way with the children of Peter Rabbit and the dear old Briar Patch, and the youngsters of Danny and Nanny Meadow Mouse on the Green Meadows, and Unc Billy Possum's lively family in the Green Forest, and Little Joe Otter's two hopefuls in the Laughing Brook. So, of course, all the little Bob Whites started in to go to school almost as soon as they were out of their shells. The very first thing they learned was to mind their parents, which is the very first lesson all little folks must learn. "'You see, my dears,' explained Mrs. Bob, as they nestled under her wings, "'the great world is full of dangers, especially for little Bob Whites, and so if you want to live to grow up to be as handsome and smart as your father, you must mind instantly when we speak to you.' So as every one of the fifteen little Bob Whites wanted to live to grow up to be as handsome and smart as their father, each one took the greatest care to mind the very second Bob or Mrs. Bob spoke. While they were in the dear old briar patch they were quite safe, but just the same every little while Mrs. Bob would give the danger signal, which meant to squat and keep perfectly still, or another call that meant to come running to her as fast as ever they could. It wasn't until she was sure that they had learned to mind instantly that she led them out onto the green meadows among the grasses and the weeds. Then there was always real danger as she took great pains to tell them. There was danger from the air where old Redtail the hawk sailed round and round, watching below for heedless and careless little folks. There was danger from Reddy and Granny Fox and Old Man Coyote, prowling about with sharp eyes and keen ears and wonderful noses, all the time hunting for heedless little people. And there was danger from Mr. Blacksnake and some of his cousins, slipping silently through the grass. So the little Bob Whites learned to be always on the watch as they ran this way and that way, hunting for bugs and worms and seeds. At the least little unknown sound, they squatted and waited for Mrs. Bob's signal that all was well. She taught them to know old Mr. Buzzard, who wouldn't hurt a feather of them, from old Redtail the Hawk by the way he sailed and sailed without flapping his wings. Just as soon as they could fly a little, she taught them to make sure just where the nearest bushes or trees were, so that they could fly to them in case of sudden danger on the ground. She taught them how to find the safest places in which to spend the night. Oh, there was a great deal for those little Bob Whites to learn, yes, indeed, and it didn't do to forget a single thing. Forgetting just once might mean a dreadful thing. So they didn't forget. Bob White himself taught them many things, for Bob is wise in the ways of the great world, and he is the best of fathers. So the little Bob Whites grew and grew, until they were too big to nestle under the wings of Mrs. Bob, and could fly on swift, strong wings. And all the time they were at school without knowing it. CHAPTER Thirteen, FARMER BROWN'S BOY BECOMES THOUGHTFUL 
for everything that happens you've but to look to find there's bound to be a reason so keep that fact in mind son said farmer brown one morning at the breakfast table we've got the finest looking garden anywhere around i don't remember ever having a garden with so little harm done by bugs and worms all our neighbors are complaining that bugs and worms are the worst ever this year and that their gardens are being eaten up in spite of all that they can do i'm proud of the way in which you've taken care of ours farmer brown's boy flushed with pleasure he had worked hard in that garden ever since the seeds were planted he had fought the weeds and the bugs and worms but so had some of his neighbors yet in spite of this their gardens were nearly ruined they had worked just as hard as he had, but the worms and the bugs had been too much for them. He couldn't understand why he had succeeded when they had failed. There must be a reason. There is a reason for everything. After breakfast he put on his old straw hat and started down to the garden to look it over, still puzzling over the reason why his garden was so much better than others just on the edge of the garden was an old board he lifted one end of it and peeped under old mr toad looked up at him and blinked sleepily but in the most friendly way mr toad's waistcoat was filled out until he looked too tight for comfort farmer brown's boy smiled as he put the board down gently he knew what made that waistcoat so tight it was filled with bugs and worms there's part of the reason muttered farmer brown's boy a little farther on he discovered little friend the song sparrow very busy among the berry bushes there's another part of the reason chuckled farmer brown's boy at the end of a long row he sat down to think it over there was no doubt that he owed a great deal to old mr toad and little friend and a lot of the feathered folk of the old orchard for his fine-looking garden but he had had their help in other years when his garden had not looked half as well, and yet when there had not been nearly as many bugs and worms as this year. Their help and his own hard work accounted for part of the reason for his fine-looking garden, but he couldn't help but feel that there must be something else he didn't know about. He was thinking so hard that he sat perfectly still. Presently, a pair of bright eyes peeped out at him from under a berry bush then right out in front of him stepped a smart trim little fellow dressed in brown gray and white with black trimmings it was bob white he called softly and out ran mrs bob and fifteen children at a word from bob they scattered and went to work among the plants farmer brown's boy held his breath as he watched they didn't pay the least attention to him because you know he sat perfectly still some scratched the ground just like the hens at home and then picked up things so small that he couldn't see what they were but he knew he knew that they were tiny seeds and because all the seeds which he and farmer brown had planted were now great strong plants he knew that these were seeds of weeds bob himself was very busy among the potato vines he was near enough for farmer brown's boy to see what he was doing he was eating those striped beetles which farmer brown's boy had fought so long and which he had come to hate one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven counted farmer brown's boy and then bob moved on to where he couldn't be seen among the squash vines he could see mrs bob and she was picking off bugs as fast as bob was taking the potato beetles what the others were doing he didn't know but he could guess there's the rest of the reason he suddenly exclaimed in triumph he spoke aloud and in a twinkling there wasn't a bob white to be seen chapter fourteen a little lesson in arithmetic don't say you hate arithmetic and find it dull and dry you'll find it most astonishing if you sincerely try 
Farmer Brown's boy used to feel that way, but he doesn't any more. He never could see any use in puzzling over sums in school. He said that there wasn't anything interesting in it, nothing but hard work. He used to complain about it at home. Farmer Brown would listen a while, then he would say, If you live long enough, my son, you will find that figures talk, and that they tell the most wonderful things. There was always a twinkle in his eyes when he said this. Now, of course, Farmer Brown's boy knew that his father didn't mean that figures could speak right out. Of course not. But he never could understand just what he did mean, and he wasn't interested enough to try to find out. So he would continue to scowl over his arithmetic and wish the teacher wouldn't give such hard lessons. And when the long summer vacation began, he just forgot all about figures and sums until after he discovered Bob White and his family helping to rid the garden of bugs and worms and seeds of weeds. After he discovered them, he went down to the garden every day to watch them. They soon found out that he wouldn't hurt them, and after that they just paid no attention to him at all, but went right on with their business all about him. And that business was the filling of their stomachs with seeds and worms and bugs. One day Bob White ate twelve caterpillars while Farmer Brown's boy was watching him. He got out a stubby pencil and a scrap of paper. If every one of those Bob Whites eats twelve of those horrid worms at one meal, that would be... Um, let me see. He wrinkled his brows. There are Bob and Mrs. Bob and fifteen young bobs, and that makes seventeen. Now, if each eats twelve, that will make twelve times seventeen. He put down the figures on his bit of paper and worked over them for a few minutes. That makes two hundred and four caterpillars for one meal, he muttered, and in one month of thirty days they would eat six thousand one hundred and twenty if they only ate one meal a day. But they eat ever so many meals a day, and that means... He stopped to stare at the figures on the bit of paper with eyes round with wonder. Then he whistled a little low whistle of sheer astonishment. No wonder I've got a good garden when those fellows are at work in it, he exclaimed. Then he sat down to watch Mrs. Bob catching cabbage butterflies, which he knew were laying the eggs which would hatch out into the worms that spoiled the cabbages. He counted the number she caught while she was in sight. He did the same thing with another of the Bob Whites who was catching cucumber beetles, and with another who was hunting grasshoppers. Then he did some more figuring on that bit of paper. When he had finished, he got up and went straight down to the cornfield where Farmer Brown was at work. I know now what you meant when you used to tell me that figures talk, said he. Why, they've told me more than I ever dreamed. They've told me that the Bob Whites are the best friends we've got, and that the reason that we've got the best garden anywhere around is just because they have made it so. Why, those little brown birds are actually making money for us, and we never guessed it. Chapter 15. Farmer Brown's Boy Grows Indignant To be indignant is to be angry in a good cause. If you lose your temper and give way to anger because things do not suit you, you are not indignant, you are simply angry. But if anger wells up in your heart because of harm or injustice which is done to someone else, or even to yourself, then you become indignant. Farmer Brown's boy had spent all his spare time down in the garden watching Bob White and his family. In fact, he had been there so much that all the Bob Whites had come to look on him as harmless, if not actually a friend. They just didn't pay him any attention at all, but went about their business as if he were nowhere about. And their business was ridding that garden of bugs and worms and seeds of weeds in order to fill their stomachs. What tickled Farmer Brown's boy was that the bugs and worms of which they seemed the most fond 
were the very ones which did the most harm to the growing plants. Over beyond the garden was a field of wheat. You know, from wheat comes the flour of which your bread is made. Now there is a certain little bug called the chinch bug, which is such a hungry rascal that when he and a lot of his kind get into a field of wheat, they often spoil the whole crop. They suck the juices from the plant so that they wilt and die. Farmer Brown's boy had heard his neighbors complaining that chinch bugs were very bad that year, and he knew that they must be by the looks of the wheat on the farms of his neighbors. But Farmer Brown's wheat looked as fine as wheat could look. It was very plain that there were no chinch bugs there, and he often had wondered why, when they were so bad in the fields of his neighbors. Farmer Brown's boy noticed that Bob White and his family spent a great deal of time in the wheat field. One day he noticed Bob picking something from a stem of wheat. He went over to see what it might be. Of course, Bob scurried away, but when Farmer Brown's boy looked at that wheat plant, he found some chinch bugs on it. Then he knew what Bob had been doing. He had been picking off and eating those dreadful little bugs. And he knew, too, why it was that their wheat field was the best for miles around. It was because Bob White and his family hunted for and ate those bugs as fast as they appeared. Hurrah for you! You're the greatest little helpers a farmer ever had! cried Farmer Brown's boy, and hurried off to tell Farmer Brown what he had found out. So the summer passed, and the cool, crisp days of autumn came. The wheat had been harvested, and the vegetables gathered and stored away. Jack Frost had begun to paint the maple trees red and yellow. The garden was bare, and the stubble in the wheat field a golden brown. The little feathered people who do not like cold weather had flown away to the sunny Southland, led by old Mr. Buzzard. Striped Chipmunk, Chatterer the Red Squirrel, and Happy Jack the Gray Squirrel were busy from morning till night, storing away seeds and nuts on which to live through the long cold winter. These were glorious days, and Bob White loved every one of them. "'Son,' said Farmer Brown one morning, "'those Bob Whites must be fat with the good living they have had. Now, seeing that we have fed them off the farm all summer, don't you think that it is their turn to feed us? I think broiled Bob White on toast would taste pretty good. The shooting season begins next week, so I suppose you will get out your gun and shoot a few of those Bob Whites for us. There was a twinkle, a kindly twinkle in his eyes as he spoke. But Farmer Brown's boy didn't see that twinkle. His face grew red. A hot anger filled his heart. He was indignant. He was very indignant to think that his father should ever hint at such a thing. But he didn't forget to be respectful. No, sir, said he. I wouldn't shoot one of them for anything in the world. They don't owe us anything. We owe them. If it hadn't been for them, we wouldn't have had half a crop of wheat and our garden would have been just as poor as those of our neighbors. I'm not going to shoot em, and I'm not going to let anyone else shoot em if I can help it, so there. End of section four.